Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about climate. The American Meteorological Society has just released a report blaming all the weather of 2018 on climate change. There is way too much junk science in this article to cover it all, so I'm just going to cover the first topic which they mentioned. December 9th, 2019, San Francisco, California. The desiccating Four Corners drought, intense heat waves on the Iberian Peninsula and in Northeast Asia, exceptional precipitation in the mid-Atlantic states, and record low sea ice in the Bering Sea were 2018 extreme weather events made more likely by human-caused climate change. I've lived the vast majority of my life in the Four Corners states of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. So this topic of blaming the 2018 Four Corners drought on global warming is of particular interest to me. I was born in Los Alamos, New Mexico, on the edge of the Jemez Mountains. There have been some excellent proxy studies done of drought in the Jemez Mountains over the last 1,200 years. This graph of precipitation goes back to the year 800. When precipitation is below the red line, that indicates drought conditions. You can see that there's been dozens of droughts in the Jemez Mountains going back over the last 1,200 years. These droughts occur at fairly regular intervals, and they generally have wet periods in between them. The American Meteorological Society apparently believes that all of these dozens of droughts were natural, but the most recent one was man-made. And they say they have science to back up their superstition. I've been fighting this battle with climate alarmists for more than a decade. A lot of people moved to New Mexico during this unusually wet period around the 1980s. So of course they assumed that wet is the normal climate of New Mexico. I wrote an editorial in the Santa Fe New Mexican newspaper in 2012 explaining their fallacy. My editorial was titled, Drought is the Normal for New Mexico. That's why New Mexico is a desert. I'll read you the first few paragraphs of my editorial. Mary Wolf of the Collected Works Bookstore recently made some valid observations describing how the climate has changed in New Mexico since her store opened in 1978. I remember the opening of her store, a valuable asset to the community. To understand New Mexico climate, though, we need to look much further than 1978, which, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, was the coldest and snowiest winter in U.S. history. Looking back to the 13th century, the Anasazi of Chaco Canyon were wiped out primarily because of a multi-decade drought, much more severe than anything seen in modern times. A lot of people move to the west to get out of the rain, and then they get upset that it doesn't rain here much. There was a period of very severe droughts in New Mexico from about 1890 until 1905. These caused massive forest fires as reported in June 1890. The forest fires, their sweeping Colorado mountains, thousands of acres laid waste. From telegraphic reports received here today, it would seem that a great portion of the Sangre de Cristo range in Colorado and New Mexico is in flames. A special from Española, New Mexico says, The valley is obscured by smoke from the burning mountains east of Española. The fire extends over 20 miles up and down the Santa Fe range and makes a beautiful and weird appearance. The fire has been burning for several days now, and no attempt has been made to extinguish it. The loss will be great. During the 1980s, I worked for a while as a wilderness ranger in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains north of Santa Fe. It was extremely wet, and the snow was very deep the summer I was up there. This is what the burn area looks like now, 130 years later. Fire is an essential part of the forest cycle. These forest fires, which grew as a result of the 1890 fires, are now a huge tourist attraction in Santa Fe and one of the reasons why people like to live there. It's unfortunate that so many people who consider themselves to be green have very little understanding of how nature actually operates. Now I'm going to take a short detour away from the Four Corners area. 1890 wasn't just dry in New Mexico and Colorado, it also brought some of the largest fires on record to Minnesota. May 8, 1890. Fire everywhere in the northwest. The most extensive forest fires ever known in this section of Minnesota have been raging for the last three days. Back to New Mexico now. This was the September 1925 edition of National Geographic. They documented the excavation of Pueblo Bonito in Chaco Canyon. Pueblo Bonito was the largest pre-Columbian apartment building in the western hemisphere. It was abandoned in the late 13th century after 70 years of drought. One of the most impressive archaeological finds made at Pueblo Benito was this turquoise necklace. This is what it looked like after they got it cleaned up. It had been buried under 15 feet of sand and debris. 
As I mentioned in my editorial, drought is the normal climate for the West. That's why it's a desert. This graph was published in the San Jose Mercury News a few years ago and shows the long history of droughts in the West. A 200-year drought? Evidence from tree rings shows that drought was historically much more widespread in the American West than now, while the 20th century was wetter than normal. The graph shows the percentage of the West affected by drought from 800 AD to the year 2000. You can see that prior to the year 1500, the West was in drought most of the time. But since the year 1500, the West has been relatively wet most of the time. California was settled during the wettest century on record, so people living there tend to have unrealistic expectations of the climate. Apparently, the American Meteorological Society believes that all of these droughts were natural, but this last little tiny one was man-made. Before the New York Times went all propaganda all the time, they used to know about the drought and fires in the West. New York Times, December 1, 1992. Swetnam and co-workers have discovered that major fire conflagrations sweeping across many mountain ranges in California and the Southwest were long a common feature, occurring at least twice a decade and apparently linked to oceanic currents much further south, the so-called La Nina events that often result in droughts. Finding this synchronicity in fire events was a big surprise to us, he said. It tells me that western landscapes in pre-settlement era were very smoky places. So in 1992, the New York Times understood that fire and drought in the West was controlled by ocean circulation patterns and not carbon dioxide. Two years later, the New York Times had a very similar article discussing a 220-year-long drought and a 140-year-long drought. They called it the Sierra Mega Drought. Here's another very interesting article from the New York Times in 1992. In unexpected places, clues to ancient and future climate, warming, Tree rings say not yet. The Laboratory of Tree Ring Research at the University of Arizona, a sprawling warren of dim rooms wedged underneath the campus football stadium, harbors about one million specimens of wood. And every one of those wood specimens tells an astonishing story. Some tell tales of searing infernos that swept for tens of thousands of acres across the ranges of the Great Basin. Flames leaping from one parched slope to the next like shining panthers pouncing on fresh prey. Other specimens speak of insect plagues almost biblical in their brutality as swarms of spruce budworms descended on proud stands of Douglas fir and stripped their foliage to near-death nakedness. The wood tells of volcanic eruptions tossing kilotons of ash and sulfur high into the stratosphere, of flash floods and pitiless frosts, of ancient droughts in what's now the western United States that lasted for centuries and surpassed in extremity anything modern Californians, despite all they know about water rationing, can even begin to fathom. Lisa J. Gromlich examines the ring patterns of foxtail pine trees and western junipers in the Sierra Nevada, has compiled a detailed record of the year-to-year -year variation in temperature and precipitation over the last thousand years. She has seen in the North American trees the feathery but unmistakable signatures of the medieval warm period, an era from 1100 to 1375 A.D when according to European writers of the time and other sources, the climate was so balmy that wine grapes flourished in Britain and the Vikings farmed the now frozen expanse of Greenland, and the Little Ice Age, a stretch of abnormally frigid weather lasting roughly from 1450 to 1850. We can now see that these were global climate phenomena, not regional temperature variations, she said. The question is, how did we get those warmer temperatures during pre-industrial times and what can we learn from these conditions about what is going on today? This one New York Times article pretty much destroys Michael Mann's hockey stick and the entire basis of climate alarmism. This article was from 1992 and something happened the next year. Al Gore took office and everything changed. Starting in 1993, academics who didn't tow the global warming line which Al Gore wanted them to tow lost their funding. This included people like Dr. Bill Gray at Colorado State University and Dr. Will Happer at Princeton. And it was also the end of honest climate journalism at the New York Times. Here's another interesting California story from Scientific American. California mega flood lessons from a forgotten catastrophe. A 43-day storm that began in December 1861 put central and southern California underwater for up to six months, and it could happen again. 
In 1861, farmers and ranchers were praying for rain after two exceptionally dry decades. In December, their prayers were answered with a vengeance as a series of monstrous Pacific storms slammed one after another into the west coast of North America from Mexico to Canada. The storms produced the most violent flooding residents have ever seen before or since. 66 inches of rain fell in Los Angeles that year, more than four times the normal annual amount, causing rivers to surge over their banks, spreading muddy waters for miles across the arid landscape. Large brown lakes formed on the normally dry plains between Los Angeles and the Pacific Ocean, even covering vast areas of the Mojave Desert. In and around Anaheim, flooding of the Santa Ana River created an inland sea four feet deep, stretching up to four miles from the river and lasting four weeks. So they had two decades of drought followed by the largest flood on record. If this happened now, climate scientists would say they're 100% certain that this couldn't have happened at lower CO2 levels. California was having a drought in 2016 and Wired Magazine said, Thanks El Nino, but California's drought is probably forever. And a few months later, California was having their wettest year on record. Many climate alarmists appear to be incapable of learning. They repeat the same mistakes over and over again. Let's go back now to the 2018 New Mexico drought. I was in Los Alamos in May when the drought ended. I met this friendly fellow on the drive down from Colorado. It was extremely dry when I got there. There was very little green visible on the ground between the trees. But things changed quickly after I got there. There were two days of torrential rain and then consistent rain and snow for the rest of the year, which greened up the Four Corners states quite a bit. I took this picture later in the summer in Boulder, Colorado. Here's some more pictures from Boulder during the summer of 2018. Boulder is one of the few places where you can see both white-tailed deer and mule deer. Here's a white-tailed buck I saw along a bike trail. And here's a couple of mule deer bucks I saw along the road to Ankar. A bow hunting acquaintance of mine got this hybrid buck. You can see that one of the antlers belongs to a mule deer and the other one belongs to a whitetail. It was most likely the offspring of a white-tailed buck and a mule deer doe. I saw this owl a lot during the summer of 2018. It's unfortunate that climate alarmists can't be wise like he is. When I went back to New Mexico in August, it was very green. This double rainbow over a solar farm shows the tremendous benefits of green energy. In September, I moved to Arizona and spent the fall and early winter in Phoenix. They had their wettest October on record, and the desert got very green. By Christmas of 2018 in Los Alamos, they had record amounts of snow on the ground. And by New Year's Day, the Sonoran Desert northeast of Phoenix was buried in deep snow. On February 22nd of this year, Arizona had their snowiest day on record. And due to all the snow, the ski area at Flagstaff stayed open into May, which is the first time that ever happened. I read the American Meteorological Society report, and for some reason they forgot to mention all this. It's almost like they have an agenda. Everybody is susceptible to climate alarmism. I moved from Austin, Texas to Albuquerque, New Mexico at the end of May of 1994. There was an incredible heat wave during the last week of June of 1994 across the southwest. Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas all set or tied their record temperature. I was absolutely convinced that the climate of Albuquerque was breaking bad due to global warming. But exactly one year later, I was living in Boulder, Colorado during their coldest and snowiest spring on record. Unlike the climate alarmists at the American Meteorological Society, I was capable of learning. But then again, my livelihood doesn't depend on spreading global warming propaganda like theirs does. Visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science and propaganda for a long time.